The Olympics was an interesting episode in the story, the unfolding story of East London. That's the critical thing. Um, and uh, we're at the beginning of the next chapter. So what are we going to do about this? Um, now, I, I, I was in government, um, the Olympic legacy, regeneration advice or some such. I wasn't really on message. And I got really fed up with my colleagues who've never been to East London before and never have been back to East London since. I, I was appointed because I was the only person where Stratford was, I think, in Whitehall. So, um, and they, you know, as if they were some other magnificent seven. You know, they come in, they ride into town, white hats on, and they put, they wrong, they right the wrongs, and then they, they ride away. You know, that's a kind of a strong feel about that. To me, the question is, are we better placed now to pursue our goals? I say our goals, I have no idea whether it's our goals, certainly my goals, of a more economically engaged region and a more socially just city. That seemed to be underpinning a lot of this. And the question there is, well, what are we going to do about this? Who's going to do it? How's it going to be done? And I think this is a really challenging question. Um, legacy was a huge sort of extrovert concept. It was everyone's going to benefit communities and benefit everybody. We're all going to be inspired. The reality of it, it was a very introvert kind of process focused on the Olympic Park, Olympic Park and a lot of what we heard today was how many houses, how many affordable houses are the Olympic Park creating as if that amounts to a hill of beans quite honestly in the total context of, of housing needs in East London. Um, and, uh, and it's built around the, the mechanism really of the LLBC, the legacy, you know, so everything focuses on what they're doing as if that's what East London is about, and it ain't. And actually, I think they're doing quite a good job, for the record. Um, but, you know, that, that's not, that question, how, how influential is that, and never at this, you can have an argument about this, how influential is that in the general sort of changing shape of East London? The fact is that most legacy was fantasy, you know, so there wasn't a great deal of science linking um, the aspirations for innovation, uh, aspirations for inspiration and sport take up, never has been. The fact is, but you, you, if you spend 8 billion, or actually it is closer to 16 billion in, in, in reality, uh, you expect some sort of long term benefit from it. It's going to be something you can build. So let's understand what that is. As far as I can see, there's no structured strategic response or plan. Now, I'm, I'm veteran strategic. I've worked in these organizations that think strategic. Maybe that's totally unnecessary, you know, this kind of corporate solution. But there's none of that. Um, there was none of that beforehand. I struggled to try and encourage the boroughs and others. Um, we did have the host borough. I worked for the host borough. Uh, I was seconded, I didn't get on with my colleagues in government, and I was seconded to the host borough. And I wrote large chunks of the conversions report, actually. But I, it, it was abstractions, it was political, it didn't have a great deal of, you know, we said, can we have an action plan by next month? You know, the regeneration of East London, the reaction plan, I mean, nonsense, total nonsense. So, um, I mean, Alan talked about there was no counterfactual. There was, there was no counterfactual for the regeneration of East London before the Olympics. There was a sort of mishmash, earnest, and, and I was involved, and I was, kept me employed, and, relatively wealthy, so I can't complain, but this mishmash of, of uh, physical property-led investment, London Docklands, you know, they had city challenges knocking about, there were hats knocking about, um, and, uh, but these are actually rather unlikely bedfellows, putting these different things together, we all know, anybody who knows anything about regeneration knows that property-led regeneration has one kind of set of outputs and outcomes, and, and it doesn't necessarily engage with people. How you link, the critical question which is never really engaged, is how you link property-led regeneration, which brings social benefit. I mean, local people are much better off with in, in terms of, of facilities and shopping and all these kind of fairly essential bits of life. But at the same time, how does that relate through to, to social, uh, social impacts? And as we all know, there's a lot of the social impacts, particularly in, in relation to housing, and, and, and employment, which we'll hear from, from Liz, I think, are a bit problematic. I mean, I was told many times, that we're not going to have another Canary Wharf. The Olympic development was fundamentally a property-led development in reality. If you strip away all the kind of cant and rhetoric, it was taking a big chunk of land and turning it into a chunk of land that the private sector wanted to invest in. And that's what regeneration is, for better or worse. And it's working very, very well, you know. 
it's not really any different. So we've got to think, well, what else are we going to do to actually have an impact on communities that the Olympics, frankly, was never going to have, I don't think, on any kind of substantial scale. And I think the signs are rather discouraging. So I'm, I'm in real sort of you know, down and moody. The, uh, the East London seems to be as balkanised as ever. You know, we've got competing mayors who may or may not talk to each other and so forth. Um, GLA, I don't know, it may be adding value, but I'm not sure it's adding value personally. Um, the LDA, which is the one, whether you like it or not, I worked for the LDA for a couple of years, I liked it, and uh, as an organisation to try and get to grips with some of these issues in a strategic way, it's been abolished. I don't know, Sadiq, it's been over really, I don't know, maybe years, I don't know, but it's been abolished. So the, the one agency that London had to do something on a strategic scale has been abolished. Um, the, uh, the, the, we've tried all kinds of things, Lee Valley, I've been involved in all of them, Lee Valley Partnership, Thames Gateway London Partnership, Host Borough Unit, Growth Boroughs, you know, uh, now there, is there or isn't there going to be some sort of uh, decentralisation? It was an Osborne idea, Osborne's gone, thank God, so the idea seems to have gone, but all, and that may be, you know, thank God, but all that it seems to do is create yet more sort of turbulence, really, in terms of getting to grips with the problem. So I just want to kick off. I'd like this to be, having said that, that rant, we've got two more speakers uh, to engage in this. Uh, I'd like it to be a conversation, a discussion. I think it's really, this is one of the fundamental questions facing East London. What the Olympics could have been, I thought, the real Olympic legacy was about building the institutional capacity of East London to get to grips with some of these problems and opportunities. Um, and actually, I think, and I may be wrong, but I think the Olympics is actually taken us backwards. I think you know, this fancy about the Olympics being the solution, the Magnificent Seven, has taken over. Um, and uh, we seem to have lost our way a bit in terms of getting to grips strategically with the problems that we face. I think the previous presentation already talked about um, education for younger people. And in terms of the, you know, the quantitative statistics, it's not just Newham, but across all six growth boroughs, the sort of gap between the average for London and the young people in our schools is narrowing and narrowing, and that is a huge success story. It's not, partic it's not part of the Olympics or Olympic legacy necessarily, but it's part of um, a very, very good um, education strategy that this part of London had for a number of years and was well resourced. Um, but what, what's convergence? Um, Ralph said he worked on the first convergence strategy back in 2009. And it was trying to take the sort of the Olympic statement about the most enduring legacy of the Olympics will be the regeneration of a community for everyone who lives here. And say, well, how, how do we define that? How do we make that our sort of vision? for East London, how do we try and work together to achieve, achieve that? And at the time, before I started working in the team, um, Ralph and a few others um, came up with this idea of convergence for the average for London. So in most sort of social and economic indicators, London is above the average for the UK, but East London is well below. Um, and the idea was about social justice for East London. Use the Olympics to try and achieve social justice for East London. That's the aim. It's a very, very ambitious aim. People who know much about the sort of history of East London know we were the harbour for the poor. You know, you can see in Booth's poverty map that we're the area where the vicious semi-criminals lived. Um, it, to try and change something that is sort of st systemic deprivation and long-standing poverty in an area in 20 years is a huge, huge task. So that's kind of what the task of convergence is about. Um, in terms of recent history, you've heard already at some of the opening, um, the opening speeches about what, the, what was in the Olympic bid about the most during legacy of the Olympics will be the regeneration of an entire community. Um, and I've said that in 2009, in the host borough unit, they tried to realise that and come up with a sort of framework for that. Um, and the statement for 
convergence then is that within 20 years, the communities that hosted the games will have the same social and economic chances as the neighbours across London. So as Ralph said, in 2009, there wasn't an action plan that went with the strategic regeneration framework. It talked more about sort of some big ideas and what the gap between the average for London and the host boroughs was. But um, in 2011, then, an action plan was published and agreed, and a lot of that was around, um, wasn't around long-term legacy, as we're talking about today, but at, in 2009, it was about how do we try and achieve the most we can out of the Olympic Games for local people. So I mean, some of that was about people working on the park, and initially, we weren't very keen on the short-term jobs on the Olympics. But as the time got nearer, we realised that there were so many local people who'd got such poor CVs with very little work experience that actually a job on the Olympics could be a springboard to employment in a way we not sort of, you know we were we hadn't thought about before. So we did actually work really hard with the the lo LOCOG to try and get people into those short-term jobs. And that did work really well. We overachieved on all the targets for that. Um, then in uh, 2015, we drafted a new convergence plan with actions around um, just transport and employment. But if we move on to the economic indicators, the, in the whole sort of economic and uh, education indicators, there are more. and. If you look at the bigger table, it does look like we're doing better, but that is basically on the back of the education attainment, for both for sort of primary school kids, kids doing their GCSEs, young people doing their A-levels. Um, they're all doing extremely well, and I can give you stuff. I can sort of send those statistics around to people. But what, what I wanted to concentrate on today is just the set of economic indicators for adults in terms of the employment rate, the unemployment rate, median earnings, job density, and skills for people with no skills at all and those with sort of qualified to at least level four, which is taken as the indicator for sort of graduates and a lot of the jobs that will be coming up in the future on that. So if we go on to the employment rates, Next slide. Um, you can see that the statistics have been sort of going up and down. Um, but in September 15, there was a huge, for statistics at that, this level, a huge sort of leap forward in the employment rate. And that was basically on the back of the huge improvement in Newham. Um, so as you can see, here's Newham, which was totally out of the pack in terms of the employment rate. And it sort of yo-yoed along a little bit, but now it's, it's up there in the pack. And in terms of, I mean, convergence is about six boroughs collectively converging with the average for London. But also, and in quite a number of the statistics, the boroughs are actually converging together closer as well. And there's um, a good story on that. So employment is going quite well. We consider that indicator to be green. We haven't got the we haven't got the sort of qualitative research. We've only got this quantitative data, and so we don't know if to what extent the employment rate in Newham has gone up because of new people moving in or to what extent it's gone up because of people who were living here in 2009 being in employment. So, the next slide then on unemployment looks at the unemployment rate. And again, there's improvement with London as a whole, the gap's been closing. Though in 2015, it sort of widened slightly, um, which was quite different from the the employment rate story. Now, as I said, we haven't got any sort of rich qualitative data on this. We, you know, originally there were plans to do tracking studies and all sorts of different studies around 
looking at this and the money went. There, there has been no resources to do um, sort of in-depth legacy research. But what I've put here is um, instead of statistics, the actual numbers of people who are on benefits. Um, and again, the time frame. Now what's really fascinating about this, and I only did this last week, and I was, I was surprised at it myself, um, is that we all knew the story about people on JSA going down. Um, so there's a huge tumble of figures of people on that benefit. It sort of halved over that period. And I also knew that people on IB and ESA weren't going down. So that's some like invalidity benefit, another sort of out of work benefit, but where they're not actively seeking employment. And I'd sort of suspected it when it's going up, but I wasn't expecting that it was going up so much that actually, if you look at the 2009 figures and the 2016 figures, it's actually higher in 2016 than it was in 2009. And that's not just in the growth boroughs, that's in London as a whole as well, if you look at those figures. So, although the unemployment rate is looking um, like it's doing well, the actual underlying figures for that are telling a slightly different story. Um, and again, we haven't got the data or research to know about, there seems to have been a pinnacle of um, people on both those benefits in about 2013 and we don't know where those people have gone if they've gone into employment if they've been sent to Birmingham to Stoke-on-Trent or we, we haven't got the rich data to know what's, hap what's the story behind those figures but at least we've got those figures now which tells a sort of slightly different story to just looking at the rate Next slide, please. So, in terms of jobs and income, um, job density hasn't, in terms of the national statistics, if we take them for the growth boroughs and for London as a whole, the gap between the growth boroughs and London hasn't changed since 2009. And job density is about the number of jobs per economically active person in that borough or neighbourhood. Um, but if we look at job numbers and you know, <coughs> jobs in the growth boroughs over this period have increased significantly, but they've also increased as a percentage of the total number of jobs in London, which is quite interesting. So you would think that would be reflected then in the job density, the gap, because if the, you're taking a bigger share of London's jobs, um, it should be reflected in the job density calculation, but it might be just that um, that statistic is sort of trailing the figures a little bit. Um, then weekly median earnings, that's another of the indicators that's doing particularly badly. So the gap there has grown since September 10. So there was a 6.3% gap in earnings, there's now a 7.3% gap in earnings. Um, so that's rag rated red. Then adult qualifications. As I said at the beginning, we've just looked at two here, which is the people with no qualifications at all, and that gap has been reducing quite steadily, though 2015 it widened a little bit from 2014 and the people on who've got level four or sort of graduate level qualifications has again been decreasing over time but it has sort of bumped along it's not a sort of steady progression at all I mean the last time I published this data in 2014 was probably the worst year and it was sort of rag rated red whereas now it's amber and the two slides beneath show you the boroughs. And in terms of low qualifications, again, the story is one of convergence in the growth boroughs. In terms of NVQ level four, 
there's as much, there's a sort of, there is no convergence within the growth, whereas Barking and Dagenham is very much sort of trailing behind in terms of those. And the rest of the boroughs are bunching up. And so, sort of, again, Newham is the one that's gone from being an outliner into the, into the mainstream of the boroughs. Now, I'll take you through a few statistics on in index of multiple deprivation, which again were alluded to in the earlier session. Um, there's been a lot of movement. In 2010, we were still showing that the growth boroughs were in the bottom, the bottom sort of 10 in London. So these are national rankings, not London rankings, by the way. But even in 2015, with all the improvement, growth boroughs are still the first, second, third, and fourth most deprived boroughs in London. But there's been a lot of movement against sort of basically the north of England, where more of those boroughs have been sort of ascending the ranks. But it does show a picture. I mean, to go from second to 25th is quite a huge jump in the five year period. Whereas Tower Hamlets has stayed the same, Hackney stayed the same, but it's only Newham that's really made that jump, and Greenwich. But um, um, poor old Barking and Dagenham's actually declined down the ranks. But I just thought I'd give you that as a different picture. The next is just a map of the deprivation indices over those two. And um, that's the sort of statistics around convergence and economic development. Um, I just wanted to throw some reflections up about uh, uh, the question of the cultural and creative, what we now think about as the cultural and creative economy, but more broadly, the question of, of, of arts, culture, uh, one can put heritage into this, uh, and, and the case in East London. Um, really to get some questions in front of us uh, that might help us think our way forward uh, at a time at which um, planning is difficult and uncertainty is, is, is voluminous. Um, just start with a couple of images really. Um, those of you who, who have been around for a while and used to drive up and down or walk up and down East India Dock Road will may remember this, this rather wonderful building uh, which uh, opened in 1988, uh, which was the printing press of the Financial Times. And uh, in the evening rush hour, uh, you could sit in, in your queue as you were trying to leave the centre of London, uh, watching the press's roll. This was, in a sense, the last uh, beautiful stand, beautifully framed stand, of, of uh, one of London's great traditional Industries, which was which was uh, hot metal and uh, and paper. Um, uh, when the next slide shows that, um, notwithstanding that, ten years later, the building had been closed and that site was converted to what is now Telly House, uh, which is one of uh, one of <coughs> London's big uh, data repositories. The thing has moved entirely to digital. You cannot see what's going on inside. It's all very unclear. One wouldn't know if one thought one might know who owned and worked at uh, the Financial Times and what the processes were that produced news there and paper over here. The whole thing is, is shrouded in much less certainty and detail. Uh, it's not as though it's secret, but it's certainly not intelligible to, to ordinary mortals. Um, uh, and in some ways, there's a, uh, there's a story there which we need to hold on to. Huge investment uh, in one, the beginning of a 10 year period, and 10 years later, there was digital. So, the next slide. Um, if we're to think, uh, you know, how, how can we think about, take the sector that I know most about, uh, culture and, and the creative uh, e economy, but how can we think about anything? Uh, at the point at which uh, things which are completely out with um, the Olympic project, any legacy proposition, or, or indeed any real sense of local control, how can we make some, some sense of these? On the left, uh, uh, there's a set of, you know, th th these are just five, picked not quite at random, but, but, you know, these are five big things which now frame our world, which weren't invented either as 
extended technologies, or certainly not as, as commercial and widely available applications 25 years ago. The World Wide Web itself, but you know, Orange, which is now yeah, EE, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and you know, we could add some more over the last 10 years, um, have arrived uh, at that quickly. The presumption has to be that, like electricity, uh, the world of digital is here to stay. It, it won't go. But what the form of that will be, and what the implications of that are for local employment, for skills, for the future, for the physical future of East London, for the way in which work is made uh, for culture, are uh, at this point uh, spectacularly unknowable. Um, all, all of which goes to show that actually trying to get any sense of uh, how we might plan with any certainty forwards, where do we go from here, where do we go from here in terms of trying to make some sense of this other than just waiting to see what happens to us, is, is increasingly difficult, but it's important. I, I, my, the, the only degree I have, the degree I have is in history, uh, I'm an amateur historian and I'm just interested always in the long beat of, of these things. So what are the, some of the things that, that are going to affect um, uh, the nature of uh, creative and cultural enterprise locally? Uh, well, they are going to be buildings and places. The reason that there are so many artists out in East London, this mythical figure, this apocryphal figure of 10,000 artists uh, uh, in, in Hackney and Tower Hamlets, um, is because there are buildings there that uh, have enabled them to move into affordable workspace. The question of affordable workspace and, of course, affordable housing is the flip side of that, the other side of that, uh, is, is really crucial. Affordable workspace, in London terms, is under great threat at the moment. In East London terms, is under particular threat because, of course, it's, it's, it, it is a function of there being surplus buildings which are now able to be used by the planning law change, by the, of the, the arrival of a much hotter market for these kinds of things, it, 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 uh, for the sorts of housing uh, that we've been reflecting on uh, as we go. Um, the question of the institutional architecture is, is, uh, is equally important, both the kind of legal and planning frameworks, but actually what is the relationship between the, uh, um, if you like, the indigenous cultural institutions, the long-standing Theatre Royal Stratford East, the uh, v wide range of smaller companies, the, the, the kind of community and social ventures uh, which exist already, uh, and, and those which are, are, are going to come in. We've had one run at that in terms of the Olympics. It's worth saying that uh, Chapter 17, or Theme 17, I think it was, at the Olympic bid talked about East London, which is the cultural bit. The, 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 cultural part of the Olympics talked about uh, uh, East London absolutely as there was a tabula rasa. There, there was nothing here. Culture was going to arrive. The Olympics would regenerate and regeneration really meant starting from scratch. And actually if you looked at much of what happened, uh, half, well a good part of what happened during, uh, during the Olympic cultural process was that, that there was a, a, a the presumption was that we had to import good big things from elsewhere to let the world see how it was best done, uh, and, and that was to the disadvantage of many local groups. There was quite a lot of enterprising work done by local arts institutions, the Theatre Royal included, to make some, take some advantage from that, but by and large, this was uh, large at the expense of little. Thinking about the history of the Lower Lee and history of East London, how, how do we allow for the unplanned? at the point at which the market is hot and the master planners are still out there trying to master plan. The combination of, of, of a hot property market and master planners, are, those two, uh, almost by definition, are, are, are determined to eradicate all of the cracks in the pavement because everything has another prospective value. Philip Headley, previous director of the Theatre Royal, was, was very vocal about, about the necessity to, to find uh, the underused shops, the church halls, the school halls, the places in the community where theatre groups, dance companies, small bands and others might rehearse. At the point at which everything has a market value, that is incredibly difficult. So this question about how we allow for the unplanned, uh, uh, both in terms of space and in terms of the things which 
aren't at this point part of our uh, conceptual framework <coughs> uh, are, are really crucial. And then, of course, models of enterprise and ownership themselves are changing. Uh, uh, I don't know enough about the industrial history of the Lower Lee uh, to understand, in a sense, who the investors were and where the money went from any of the things that were, you know, that were invented. Actually, in some ways, it's a, it's a history of not failed, and it's a history of, of wonderful invention, but not brilliantly successful enterprise. Um, uh, the refining of petrol was invented there. Early plastic was invented there, but uh, you know, none of those none of those have become world-beating industries based here in 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 E whatever it is. Um, and at the point at which we've got ten thousand artists, take that as a as as, as one extreme, uh, sitting alongside the kinds of companies which might be underpinning or investing in here East and the rest of the big technology enterprises locally, or indeed institutions as large as the V&A or, uh, or, uh, or, 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 you know, Saddle as well. This question about how and, and what the models of enterprise and ownership may be over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years are really crucial. Final two slides very quickly. Um, just to say that, that um, superimposed on existing trajectories of historical development, Alan's phrase from, from his presentation, Alan Brimkin's phrase from the presentation down, downstairs, is, is an absolutely good way of describing the range of layers which, exi which have existed this far uh, as, as key components in this question of, of, of what is, you know, where, where culture and, and the creative economy and arts and co might go locally. With everyday culture, the commercial providers, starting with places like the theatre, social reformers, Phil talked about Eaton Manor downstairs, uh, uh, the municipal providers, local government at a very early stage committed to parks and, and, and libraries and, and, and museums and schools. Um, artists, makers and fabricators and sense a much more mercurial uh, set of dynamics which are uh, less easy to control but absolutely present. Uh, since the 1950s and 60s, uh, certainly public funding for arts, culture and heritage and then more latterly through the lottery, um, there's another case to be told about how East London in the round is unprivileged by lottery funding, certainly in terms of, uh, uh, of arts, culture and heritage. Um, a, a, a huge kind of almost a, a sort of a world center of excellence, if I can talk about it in those terms, in, in terms of the application of arts and social enterprise to community change. So much good practice in East London over the long, a long haul. And then latterly, this business of the creative and cultural economy. How do all of these small digital and these large digital tech companies and, and software companies and inventive companies, what's their, what's their contribution in the middle of all of this? If we're now standing here in 2016 and trying to say, well, what's next? Uh, the least we need to do is understand that over, you know, what was last, in a sense, what, what's behind us is this. And it, it is, I think, pretty unknowable, really, uh, talking with a number of people who run big uh, uh, companies uh, in the sector, whereas people five or ten years ago, in, in, to my recollection, were able to think much more, were wanting to think much more strategically and would have five and ten and, and beyond year plans. Actually, very few people now uh, are now, are now you know, making detailed plans going forward. The thing is much more reactive. People are much more adept at responding. But if we're thinking about how that uh, might be planned to advantage um, you know, the young generation now over the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, it's, it's a much more difficult process, I think, particularly in this sector than it was. Um, because finally, uh, uh, um, just to use a Tim Berners-Lee quote, Liz, um, the future is so much bigger than the past. Um, uh, a lot of this stuff is genuinely unknowable. It shouldn't stop us planning. It shouldn't stop us strategizing. It shouldn't stop us understanding what principle might drive social change for what kind of version of better or improvement, uh, but actually trying to do that at this point is, 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 is difficult. Uh, and although I'm uh, ha ha 
you know, in a sense, constitutionally, I'm, I'm serially optimistic. Uh, I think it's very difficult to lodge that optimism in particular things that might happen next that will sustain the kind of cultural vibrancy and diversity that has been allowed to exist by dint of all sorts of accidents over the last 15 or 20 years here. Uh, and uh, uh, and that's a, that, again, is a, a challenge for conversation here, but it's a challenge for, for colleagues all over East London as well. Thanks, David. We know that some of the organisations like the RDA used to be in terms of sort of governance infrastructure aren't there anymore. But I think Brexit is going to have a big impact on that. I spent the last 18 months trying to get grants to realise some of the sort of convergent strategies uh, from Europe and we've secured one but um, a number of the others we haven't. But we are now getting guidance every couple of weeks saying we don't really know what's happening. You know, we've, the government's got no plans to replace European funding with anything at the moment and it also doesn't know what it's going to do about the existing European programme. So we are, the devolution plans that have been going forward across the country are something Theresa May isn't so keen on, and some of those are stalling and fragmenting. So there will be a new proposal, but no one knows what it is at the moment. So if anyone's got any good ideas on what it should be, <laughs> let me know and I'll feed that into the discussion. Right,